Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Gary. John, how are you? I'm, I'm great. I'm back from vacation. You'll yeah, notice you last I, haven't, I haven't shaved uh, since I left, so I've got this Ernest Hemingway look going. So, so you're sort of uh, like in the woods somewhere and just decided that you would go very natural. That's right. Exactly mm-hmm. right. It, it, it's, uh, to be honest, it's pure laziness. <laughs> well, you can't be lazy today because we've got a uh, jam-packed show. Well, we do. In fact, we may as well jump right into it. Let, let's bring them in. We've got Jeff Stout from Young Fang and Tu Lee from Sino Auto Insights. And just so the audience knows, Tu, what a trooper. He's in, <laughs> he's in Beijing right now. It's 12 hours difference. It's the middle of the morning there. And then we got Jeff, who's about to head for Shanghai later this evening after the show. So uh, I'm glad you guys were able to carve out a little bit of time for your schedules for us. See, no see, rest for the weary. See, see, these guys are troopers. You won't even shave because you're so damn lazy. Uh, hey, <laughs> lazy I'm looking forward to the my, day. Lazy is my middle name. I would have been sleeping anyways, John, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Well, too, what's it like? I mean, what's it like traveling in China these days? I mean, you've lived there and everything like that, but then you came back to the States and, you know, the, the whole COVID thing went crazy in China. What, what's it like now? So there's a bit of anxiousness as I went to customs and there's always confusion because there's forms you need to fill out. And I had PTSD because I wasn't sure if there were QR codes I needed. I wasn't sure if I needed to wear masks. And shockingly enough, it was uh, a breezy process. So Jeff, I think uh, if you're flying into Shanghai, it should be fairly, fairly easy. Uh, and then, you know, I got to Shanghai, took, uh, took a cab or a DD from Pudong, uh, the, the international airport to my hotel. And I, I did get ripped off by the cabbie because <laughs> it was about almost twice as much. And I just wasn't paying attention to, to the roads he was taking. But uh you know, Shanghai, which is one of my favorite cities in the world, uh, is a little bit subdued. I think there's still uh, some uh, kind of post-COVID, uh, I would say, uh, what's the right way to say this? Post-COVID. Trepidation? No? Yeah, yeah. And But um, that quickly went away on you know Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as we we're building up to the Shanghai Auto Show. I came early to get through the jet lag and visit a couple of, uh, of OEMs or some EV companies. And so I can talk about that in a little bit, but uh, you know, the Shanghai Auto Show, I was there the last two days. I took the speed train that goes about 350 kilometers an hour mm-hmm. from Shanghai to Beijing. And it took me about four hours and now I'm in Beijing and tomorrow afternoon, I'll jump in an autonomous vehicle uh, from Baidu to test that out. So, cool. um, you know, uh, I'm a visitor, but it still feels like home a little bit, mm-hmm. if, that, if that sounds um, yeah. okay. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff, what were your uh, uh, anticipation of going to China now? You haven't been there in a while, right? I haven't been there in a while. It's probably been four years. So I had a ticket to fly to Shanghai um, uh, March of 2020. Uh, it turns out that flight didn't happen. Uh, I, I still remember... Uh, kind of funny to think back flashbacks uh when they canceled my flight delta i was in flying delta they announced that they were going to ha- they were going to cancel all flights to china for 30 days and i thought 30 days i mean come on a week i get but 30 you don't need to can three years later uh yeah. okay the cancellations have finally started to clear so um I've been in contact. Obviously, uh, the world is like this right uh, so i have conversations with china every day um but being face to face changes everything. So looking forward to kind of being there and actually uh, interacting, brainstorming with the team, uh, interacting with them. Uh, but for sure, uh, it, it's there's definitely I, I would argue uh, COVID residue uh, that there's this hesitancy about. I think we're in the clear. Are, are we really in the clear? Uh, that's the sense I get from the team that I've talked to. So I'm looking forward to like to the uh, experience what that's like on the street. Well, well, Jeff, for, for the members of the audience who are not familiar with YF, and mm-hmm. you know just don't know about it, know about you, just give us a brief synopsis. 
Yeah, uh, just real quick uh, intro. So Yun Feng, um, it's the right way you're supposed to say it, which 99.9% .9 of the people get that wrong. Uh, you can go with YF. Uh, well, if you YF because I was going to say it wrong. Exactly. <laughs> Yun Feng, Feng, I don't remember. Uh, so YF, uh, fairly long history in the automotive space, um, basically starting as all joint ventures. So there was a joint venture with Visteon for electronics, a joint venture with JCI, Johnson Controls, for interiors and seating, key safety systems for safety activity, uh, Still have a JV with Plastics Omni and for exteriors. Um, back in 2017, uh, JCI wanted to get out of uh, their interior business. And so they uh, formed a joint venture that was 70-30 and then YF bought out that. And so YF is the old joint venture in China as well as all of the old JCI activity for interiors. Since then, uh, having done that for five years, they've decided that they want to uh, replicate that model for the other products. So seating and safety and electronics uh, to get out of the joint ventures. Generally speaking, there's a lot of nuance here. So uh, it's a little bit different for each of the different product lines. But in general, take that product line that's in China only and start migrating that into other regions. So safety products, we've begun selling uh, safety products in Europe and North America. Seating products, we're starting to launch that in North America and Europe. Uh, and so really a vision of kind of total cabin um, relative to all of the things that are inside that vehicle, that user experience, uh, that's the world we live in. Uh, and me personally, uh, so I've been at the company for 30 years, uh, JCI before Yang wow. Feng, and then Prince before JCI, for those people old enough to remember that name. I remember <laughs> Just, Prince. Yeah, it's an eternity and ago. And a musician uh, formerly <laughs> known as. But you know him too. I'm sure you remember Prince. Um, <laughs> but the company that made interiors. Anyway, uh, so in that 30 years, I currently am responsible for innovation activity uh, across the globe. So for those different product zones, seating, safety, electronics, and interiors, uh, in North America, Europe, and China. And, and two, let's do the same thing. Tell the, the audience about Sino Auto Insights. So you are looking at someone who grew up in Pontiac, Michigan, uh, worked in the automotive space for a few years, went back to grad school, and then moved out to Silicon Valley uh, for about seven years, and then chased a girl over to Beijing. That was uh, over 13 years ago. And, uh, you know, as John, you mentioned, about seven months ago, I decided to move back to Metro Detroit, Troy, Michigan. I'll tell a quick story. Uh, we live just right off of Big Beaver in a brand new mid-rise apartment complex. And I wanted to get an electric vehicle w when I moved back. Uh, but the eight floor parking structure that adjoined the luxury apartment did not have any charging <laughs> stations. And the retail locations on the first floor did not have any charging. So guess what? I bought a Chinese built Buick Envision. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, I started Sino Auto Insights about seven years ago in Beijing. We now have an office in Detroit as well. So one of the reasons I'm here is to meet, you know, I haven't met and talked with clients and partners for about seven months. Um, and we, the reason I started this consultancy is because I saw a lot of bad takes. Uh, I saw car guys speaking the wrong language to tech guys and vice versa. And so, as you know, John, I started with a newsletter and that's gained some popularity, but now we also do, or I also co-host a podcast called China EVs and more. And we, we as a consultancy, we do work for mobility companies. I'm probably uh, most known for my takes on electric vehicles, specifically in China. And hey, what you were quoted in the doing in Europe. You were quoted in the What's New York Times today. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well done. Yeah, so, or this week um, at least. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I actually was interviewed by CNBC for Squawk Box Asia as well, so that was pretty cool. Uh, but I got I had to get up and go to the auto show at like six o'clock in the morning, and so that was pretty fun. But uh, y you know, um, but I think the opportunity is here for us to help EV companies, mobility companies, especially because of the Inflation Reduction Act. So I'm super excited about the future. So yeah. So so Jeff, YF recently conducted a study looking at luxury. Now we're going to be talking about vehicles, but you know, you you guys looked at the the market in Asia, the US, Europe. And it seems to me that you you basically found a certain level of consistency when it came to luxury. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Uh, just real quick background on uh, the team that we have at YF that does uh, user research, consumer research. Um, it, those are our three big regions. We've got a team in North America, a team in Germany, and a team uh, in China. And so you, it's typically the the cast uh, that we, the, the demographic that we draw from. Um, and whenever we do kind of a, 
uh, our view of what a future vehicle might look like. We typically label that as an XIM, experience in motion. Uh, and so we'll spend months doing research on a particular topic as a feed stream to, okay, let's make sure that we're grounded in what the consumer's looking for when we do that vehicle. Uh, the last vehicle that just got unveiled uh, in China here the last couple of weeks um, as part of the Shanghai Auto Show, XIM 23. Uh, we're very creative uh, with our naming of the next one's going to be XM25. Just don't tell anybody. That's, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, the question was, uh, what does digital luxury mean? We, we were hearing this kind of expression from our customers and from other folks trying to understand what that means. Uh, and we went in with this notion that uh, those are mutually exclusive terms, that digital is what the kids do. That's... I'm gonna date myself, that's Instagram. Well, that's what the old people do now. I don't even know what the young kids use for social media these days. Uh, but whatever that kind of trendy uh, digital solution is for a problem, that's that's for the kids. And then there's luxury where you have opulence. You have the overstuffed chair, the, the chandelier, the whatever image you have from Italy, um, this sense of, yeah, just, old school luxury. And then okay, how do you bring those two worlds together? Uh, and so that was kind of the fundamental starting point for that research. Um, and what we found was, uh, frankly, that that was a false understanding. Um, I mean, there's elements of that that are true, that there are pieces of history that have led to that. But really, the, the two really lay on top of each other that, uh, A, uh, the and, and this is not automotive research, by the way. This is consumers would define luxury, define digital, define digital luxury. Um, people have stopped viewing luxury as being kind of that traditional sense of uh, opulence is the best word I can come up with. Um, but that's just, that that's in poor taste these days. It, it's kind of, oh, you're one of those people that thinks you need to have this flash. It, it's all about, again, we've been saying this for the last couple of years, but it just keeps being more and more true. How do I craft an experience that is luxury? So it's, it's what you feel much more so than this kind of over the top, uh, audacious presentation of wealth. Uh, and then the digital is a, um, an enabler of that. So what we ended up having uh, in the XM23, if you want to Google XM23, I'm guessing there's some uh, press release items for that, uh, was that there's really five different uh, pieces of uh, foundational building blocks for uh, for luxury. I'll run through them real quick. And if, if it's boring, just ask me a different question. Um, so the first one is just a, a pure sense of service. Uh, you go to a restaurant and I swear I took a drink of water, but every time I look at my water glass, it's full. Um, having that sense of the vehicle serving you in such a way that it just it just is always taking care of me, even without me noticing it. Uh, simplicity. I need to be able to get into a vehicle and have it do what I want it to do without me having to spend six. I think of the old Porsche Cayenne that I sat in that had 74 buttons in the floor console. It took me a weekend to figure out what every button did and why would that is not current luxury. Luxury is the simplicity of maybe it's audio controls, maybe it's gesture, some UI UX of being able to control what I want the car to do and it does it without me having to be trained on how to do it. Uh, personalization, uh, BMW went, they're a customer of ours. I love BMW, but I'm going to be a little bit critical. Uh, when they announced at CES the D vehicle, D -E -D, um, to me, they, they took this personalization idea and just took it a half a step too far where they started referring to the car as your friend. It's like, I don't think most people want a peer relationship with their car. They, <laughs> they want their car to serve them. And maybe we're a little uncomfortable with some of that language of a servant. Uh, um, but concierge, I, I want my car to support my needs. I don't want to help my car when it has needs. I only want the car to help me. Um, comfort, uh, obviously, uh, seat comfort, the number one thing. A lot of work that we're doing right now on zero gravity, just kind of this full deep recline of how do I get to a purely comfortable position in the car. Uh, and then control, uh, which control is an antithesis to uh, kind of that service where I, I want the car to do it for me, until I don't. Uh, I think of uh, Space Odyssey, right? When Hal takes over, it's like, Hal, hey, no, I'm, that's not in your best interest. So I'm not going to yeah. do that. Hey, Hal, I'm, I'm in charge here. So you want Hal to do things for you until you don't. And you want to be able to override Hal when you want to. So those five things of service, simplicity, personalization, comfort, and control. When I do those five things correctly, then I have a digital luxury or a luxury experience that's enabled by the digital technology. That's as fast as I could do. Yeah, that, 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 that was cool. really fast uh, and, and good, too. Too, I'd like to get your input on what Jeff was just talking about, because for years now, you've been saying one of the things that the, the foreign automakers have missed in China is this whole digital connection kind of thing in the car. So um, the average 
buyer of a Cadillac and Mercedes is likely 20 to 25 years younger in China than it is in the rest of the world, in the United mm -hmm. States and Europe. And uh, people born after 1990, we'll call them digital natives here in China. Mm -hmm. They were born with the mobile phone in their hand. They were born with buying things on e-commerce sites and apps using their mobile phone. So um, their, their life had nothing to do with analog. And so <laughs> to Jeff's point about having knobs and buttons and stuff like that, that's a little bit foreign to uh, the, the meat of the market here in China. And so what happened with the Chinese EV companies is, and, and you know, I uh, stopped by Jidu Auto, which is the joint venture between Jili and Baidu, spoke with the head of design and he said 70% of our uh, engineers are software engineers and 30% are traditional automotive engineers. And in most automotive companies, that's flipped. Now the ratio is getting better on the legacy side, but it's still a ways away. And so if you're prioritizing that experience and, and you know, Jeff makes good points with the five things, but consumers don't give a shit or don't care about <laughs> those five things. What they care about is, how seamlessly can this connect to my digital life? Right, right? the synthesis and of that. If we're looking, and uh, if we're looking at um, use cases, then obviously there's certain scenarios in 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 the Chinese person's life that are a lot different than someone in Europe and the United States. And what we're seeing is that the the foreign automakers have finally gotten it. And, and what I'll say is, Jeff, when you hit when when your wheels down in Shanghai and you see all these green plates your jaw is going to drop because mm -hmm. if we look at four years ago, we were at less than a million and a half NEV sold or new energy vehicles, mm -hmm. plug-in hybrids, battery electrics, plus fuel cell uh, vehicles. Last year we were at six and a half million. And if you look at Shanghai, it's the green plates that tell you if it's a, a new energy vehicle. And so let me just say, walking around on Monday and Tuesday with the huge German and European entourages, and you could always tell who they were because they had that white shirt buttoned down with the, with the suit with no tie. So you could automatically tell. And they're were, they were always kind of stern looking, right? Like you could see that their jaws were dropping, right? Because, you know, Ola Kalinius, you know, Bluma, they know what's happening in China. But the rank and file middle management, they haven't been back in four That's years. It. And so they have no, no, no idea the, the speed at which things have changed. And then on top of that, you go to Shanghai, see all these green plates, and then you go to the auto show. Um, you know, I'd said this before the, the, the cameras came on. Hall 6-1, where Neo, Xpeng, Li Auto, and a few, Ito, and a few other Chinese EV brands reside. The foot traffic there was ridiculous. And then you go into Hall 4-1 and 3-1, where the foreign legacies are. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I sat down in the Audi RS e-tron, loved the car, but there was no one around me. And I didn't have to wait 10 minutes to go sit down uh, like I did in the Zeker X, which is 190,000 RMB or, or less than $30,000. And so the excitement specifically in China is for those domestic brands and the new premium, the new luxury is is connected, is is. It has nothing to do with how leather, how nice the leather is or any of the seats. It's all about, you know, being connected, being very simple and, and high design because the Chinese consumer has matured over the years, just like anything else. And so they know what they want and it's not what it's not what the foreign legacies are giving them. So mm -hmm. is, is, there, is there a correlation between electric vehicles and more digitization on the interior? Uh, there doesn't necessarily need to be one, but I think that it just creates a, a starker contrast and kind of um, uh, uh, a distance from the traditional ICE vehicles because you can have a really great digital experience or, or user experience in a, in a combustion engine, but you know it's a bit more complicated because with the electric vehicle, you can use uh, all of the software and hardware to kind of work together to create that seamless experience. Uh, you know, even before you get into the vehicle with the inter internal combustion engine, you know, it's just, um, you can tell when uh, an, an EV is basically uh, an ICE with the powertrain with the conversion pack. ripped out. Yeah. And, compliance yeah, and a battery bolted onto it yeah so 
Uh, so I think the Chinese consumers don't appreciate these these bolt-ons or these uh, work in process. They would rather clean sheet EV design from the very beginning. And, and you can tell from the ride, you can tell from um, the design that this, this was thought through as an EV first. And I think mm -hmm. that's a huge difference maker for the China market anyways. So. Yeah, and if I could throw one small anecdote into that. Uh, again, research that we were doing, uh, there was an open question of saying, an electric vehicle and an ICE vehicle, like the fundamental uh, premise of your question, Gary, as, a, as an interior, the person sitting in the seat, the steering wheel, it really shouldn't matter whether it's a gas engine or uh, or an electric vehicle. Um, so we started to try and pry into people's uh, buying decisions and kind of how they refer to their vehicle uh, and really found that it's not causal. There, there's no reason why it has to be this way, but there was a strong correlation that people who buy electric vehicles feel like they're buying uh, kind of avant-garde, nouveau technology. Uh, and as such, they they want to be able to say, hey, I didn't just buy this new electric car and it's new. They, they want something inside the car as a proof point. Um, and so they're looking for the thing that they can go run across to their neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, come here. I bought one of those newfangled electric cars and let me show you what it can do that your car can't. And there's no reason why his whatever gas powered pickup truck couldn't have that same feature. But automakers are kind of being pulled into a direction of having a software defined vehicle for an electric vehicle, even though they could do the same thing for a gas, but, but there's an expectation that that user experience is going to be unique. And uh, avant-garde is the best expression I can think of to really kind of say, yeah, this is the way fu future mobility, that term gets thrown out all the time, but this is the future from, let me show, let me show you the proof of why this is the future. Uh, and one, Two anecdotes. Uh, one other one, uh, to two's point, uh, colleagues that I have, I'm looking forward to sitting in this. I haven't done it yet. Um, Huawei, kind of the Apple-ish counterpart in China, uh, jointly developed a vehicle with Cirrus. Uh, that's been on the road. Every Chinese colleague I talk to says that is the most amazing car ever for exactly the reason why you just mentioned. Like you could imagine what an Apple car would be, completely seamless. You walk up to the car, it's connected to your phone immediately. Everything is immediately seamlessly digitally connected because it's being designed and developed by a digital company. Um, and I guess the, maybe that's a question mark for this group of, is, is that a cautionary tale? Uh, is, is that a, yeah, it's happening in China now and you can expect that to come to the US in the next couple of years. They expect a digital native company to deliver that seamless digital experience and consumers are gonna resonate with that. And those new energy vehicle companies are gonna be at the forefront of that. And the traditional automakers are gonna struggle to keep up. Or is it, well, China's China, the consumers are different there and they have their own wants and needs that are unique to what the US consumer wants and needs. To me, that's an open question. Okay, so, so to both of you guys, okay, is, is let, the let Chinese- me, Hold on a second, let me yeah, catch yeah, yeah, Gary, yeah, let yeah, me yeah, catch this, my- this this is match. Here. Yeah, go to. Because what my argument is, is so people will say, well, you know, what China wants and what Europe wants and what the United States wants is completely different. Uh, you know, older consumers, blah, blah, blah. But you know, if, if technology is intimidating, then nobody's gonna like it. Nobody wants it. Okay, but guess what? Within the next 18, 20, 30 months, voice control, gesture control, because we already have chat GPT. It's already doing articles and stuff like that. So guess what? If, if, a, if a 60 year old person or a 30 year old person can tell a car what to do in its own language, and it, you know, in its, uh, um, let's say, not so formal language, and the car understands, everybody's gonna love that. I don't care if you're 80, I don't care if you're 30. If it, if it works, if the technology works, so this argument that you know it wouldn't resonate in Europe, it would, you know, I think that's complete BS. And because again, it's about the experience. The technology is in the software is just the enabler, right? Mm -hmm. If you create that, then people will be loyal to it, especially if, and that's why Apple and Google are so keen because that's the last part of the person's digital life that they don't have access to. You know, if we go to China, you go to the United States, technology companies know what we buy. They know what we search for. They know what entertains us. And so they know what our schedule is, but not. But the only part is they don't know what we do when we're driving. And they want to monetize that last part. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and right now, they're much better than the foreign legacies at doing that. Yeah, so. right. And so, Jeff, to your point, too, is everyone's going to the software defined car, but that's what their clean sheet EVs 
uh, you know, that most of the legacies are working on right now, but don't have out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're going to go with a software defined ice vehicle because I don't think they're going to put any money into developing Correct. all new ice platforms. So that means only the EVs are going to have all this cool stuff. And I mean, fully cool, because as you guys know, when you have a fully software defined car, I mean, this is why Tesla can do all kinds of updates all over and do recall fixes and that sort of thing, because it has a fully software defined car, which no other legacy at this point has, and probably is not going to have until around 2025 or so. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, getting to both the points that you guys are making, it's going to become very apparent like to, to your point uh, to in less than 30 months of old legacy cars, ICE vehicles can only do so much. And if you really want to step into the future, the here and now, the cool stuff, you're going to have to go electric. So, so, so Jeff, when, you know, when, when people talk about the software defined car, it seems to me that they may forget that there are still things like, oh, I don't know, seats and um, an IP and so on. I mean, so, so, so YF mm -hmm. is in the business of providing things like that. So, I mean, how would how how does the physical aspect of the software defined vehicle change or not? There's a hardware and a software element to this. Um, we don't want to get too far in the weeds, but we we did a study of saying could uh, looking for uh, the extent of uh, how we could possibly expand a software defined vehicle to include not only software OTA updates but include hardware. Um, what would it look like to have an infinitely reinvigorated vehicle that you just constantly are getting updates? Uh, it's a lot easier when you push an OTA button that you just push a software into a vehicle than it is to have a physical swap out. Um, so I, I think there's going to be severe limits to viewing it that way. The synthesis of the two, if I jump into what we're showing on XIM23, um, it does make sense where you you start uh, in kind of a uh, in entry mode, um, for example, we have a pillar to pillar display, 8K display, but there's only about 50 millimeters exposed. It's got driving functions on there. Uh, you're in a traditional driving condition, traditional driving wheel, traditional seat position. Uh, but then as I get into kind of a autonomous support, uh, that display goes up, the seat retracts a little bit. I have the ability to engage or disengage. And so there's hardware elements to this that is enabling the digital experience um, up to a full autonomous, which, save that for the second half of the show if we want to talk about where the status of full autonomous is, um, where I can get into that kind of Zen mode lighting experience. But again, the the uh, software defined vehicle is a support function on the electronic side that configures the mechanical, the seats, the instrument panel, the, the, the hardware around you, but it's all affected. Uh, so that nobody escapes uh, unscathed on the inside of the vehicle relative to that future of software defined vehicle. So if, if I may, I might throw a couple of controversial statements here because I right. think number I'm one, in. pull the software, pins out of the grenades software, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think software defined vehicle is a terrible, terrible, terrible term because it's not software defined. It's user and, you know, user experience defined, defined. right? Software is an yep. enabler. It doesn't enabler. create the experience and enables That's, the experience, right? It's not so that I think software defined is a terrible on. term. You can do better. And, and you know, <laughs> For for okay, how's how's this, Jeff? <laughs> you know, Jeff Jeff points to these studies, right? That's the problem with the automotive in 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 in, in tier ones. They need to increase the risk profile mm -hmm. and move faster, right? They they can't study stuff all day long and and point to where the market is going. They need to anticipate that stuff and they need to go take some risk. And you know, put yourself out there. That's the only way you're going to beat the technology companies because mm -hmm. they move faster and they they their mistakes can be erased very quickly. And you know, this is not an analog versus an analog company competition. This is an analog versus a digital company. So you can do those studies all you want. You can hire the McKinsey's and stuff like that. But guess what? That's going to bog you down, mm -hmm. and it's it's going to keep all these new interiors that you want to put into place, they're going to be 12, 18, 24 months too late to the market. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. So, so I wish I disagreed with you. Um, <laughs> that's, it's mostly true other than a, a couple of clarifying points. Uh, YF's not an automaker. So we're constantly developing technology and asking, does this work? Does it not work? It's the automaker who chooses uh, to do it or not do it. And frankly, 
uh, as a supplier, we love speed. Uh, when a customer comes and says, I'm going to source you this business, and we're going to be in production in nine months. That's awesome. Um, it, it's the traditional automakers that I, are really, I would say, the would receive the brunt of your comment, and I think you're spot on, that there's this sense of historically, the global automotive market knows how to develop and design and build a vehicle. It takes five years. You start with a lot of research and understanding what the you know keywords are, and then you get a design, and you have three themes, and you choose the one, then you clay, and then and we've been doing that forever. Uh, and I think Tesla probably came along first, uh, but there's a ton of companies in China that are BYD is a great example that's just blowing that up and saying, whatever, we're, we're going to do it in a year and we're going to try it. If it fails, we're going to fix it. Um, that's not a challenge. It's a little bit of a challenge for us because we've historically done it with the automakers in that pace. It, it's not so difficult for us to change our pace to, to speed up and to match the BYDs. Um, but if you're I'm not going to name an automaker since we work with all of them. Uh, one of those traditional automakers that says, hey, you're two, three, four year development time. I've had that conversation with, man, we, we're doing a, a beta prototype concept. We're going to do it in like 18 months. O okay. So you're only twice as long as everybody else, but you're, you're still twice as long. Uh, it's hard. Inertia is a powerful thing, right? Uh, it's hard for the traditional automakers to think about how would I develop a vehicle in 12 months? Yeah, but hey, th this is a great segue. So we've got to take a quick commercial break here, but I want to come back uh, for a couple of things. Uh, Toyota uh, th last week, this week, announced it's starting a whole new EV group within the company. I think this gets to speed to market that you guys are talking about. I'd love to get your reactions to that. Uh, two, you've been at the Shanghai show. I'd love to see what, you know, like some of the things you just talked about, the, the legacy displays being virtually empty. And, and the cool stuff that you saw. And, and then, Jeff, I'd love to hear what you, you hope to see in, in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. But all that's coming up in the second half of the show. And first, we're giving a good shout out to our great friends at Bridgestone. How do Bridgestone tires stop shorter on wet roads? It's their hydro track technology. But you don't have to know how the science works. Just where the brake is. What really matters is their Bridgestone. Thank you, Bridgestone. And so let, let, let's kick that off. Two, you've been at the, the Shanghai show. Uh, we've been following it uh, here in the States. There's been some really cool cars coming out. Everybody seems to be talking about BYD these days. And I'm not trying to set you up to talk about them, but what are some of your major impressions? So coming into the auto show, I'd spoken with Russell Flannery and Forbes and listed a few things that I anticipated seeing or I wanted to see. I thought I would see, you know, one of them was like phase two of uh, design for these Chinese EV companies because they're startups, they're still startups. And so some of their initial designs, initial products were a little bit clunky, but I thought I would see a little bit more maturity. And, and I've seen that, you know, some of these pictures that, that I've taken, um, you can see on the, on the interior of the vehicles and one of them's the Buick E5. So uh, you'll, you'll see, the lines and the curve just kind of make more sense and uh, seem to fit better together, right? There's the Buick E5. Uh, the second thing is that um, we would see a bit more uh, ADAS in more cars. So not just premium, ADAS being advanced driving assist systems. And so level two, level three, that's gonna be more mass market in China because guess what? It's so competitive here that you need to bring those those uh, those cutting edge features even into the uh, lower priced uh, vehicles in order to get any eyeballs or foot traffic. And then number three, I was waiting to see, and I I kind of said, does the empire strike back? Do foreign legacies come really strong uh, at Shanghai uh, Auto Shanghai twenty twenty three? And you know, after two days, twenty thousand steps a day, uh, what I can tell you is that. In China, there isn't a lot of excitement about what the foreign legacies are doing. And, you know, it was kind of crickets in the halls where the foreign legacies are. The ID7, I think that kind of got a lukewarm, which is that, that vehicle right there. I think it kind of got a lukewarm reception. And so um, the, there was so much buzz at the NEO booth, at the Xpeng booth where the G6 uh, was was launched and the Lee Auto 
Lee Otto dropped a bomb on the first day at around 9.30 at the press conference. So that's the L7 right there. That's an E-Rev. Uh, so that's, that's not a battery electric vehicle, but it's a beautiful car. And they said they were giving their AD Max, which is their autonomous driving system, away for free for life. <laughs> this is the type of, of upping the ante that these Chinese, they don't care. They're just throwing it out there because they know that they only have one chance to gain this share. And Neo's booth was beautiful, amazing. Tons and tons and tons of foot traffic. The other uh, booth that was really, really um, uh, heavily foot trafficked was Zeker. Zeker is a Geely company. It's going to IPO in the U.S. later this year. And they launched this vehicle, a little hatchback, kind of like a, a Volkswagen Golf type vehicle. Yeah, right there. Uh, a Zeker X for 190,000 RMB or about $28,000. And it, there was, I had to wait about 10 minutes to go sit in the car because there was so much excitement about it. Now it's a simple interior and that, um, that, that center console that moves from left to right with a hand gesture. Huh. So it can go from the middle to the, to the passenger side with just a simple hand gesture. And that interior is a $28,000 car. So the, the other thing to your point, John, is BYD has just been a machine over the last 20, 24 months, and they are still pushing the limits. They came out with the BYD Seagull, which is an $11,000 car. Um, that is probably going to lead foreign international markets within the, the first six or seven months. So, so too, I got a, a question a about this car. Uh, you know, with the, mm -hmm. I, up to now, I've been super impressed by the Wuling Mini, you know, the, the little mm -hmm. $4,500 right. car. But, it, you know, I think it's 60 miles an hour top speed, something like 60 miles range. I'm sure it would not pass the U.S. crash standards at all. My question is, does the Seagull, could that meet U.S. or European crash standards? Do you know? I think the, I think it's a lot closer to meeting them than than a Wuling Hongwan Mini is. Yeah, uh, because I think this will sell in countries like South Southeast Asia or regions like South Southeast Asia and Latin America, South America, really well. Um, and the the other thing is uh, that CATL and BYD is also now looking at launching the Seagull and Cherry uh, with the CATL battery with sodium ion. Now, because of the lithium prices, now sodium ion is, is a lower range vehicle, so it's going to start in the le less expensive cars first. But sodium ion could be an, a real alternative to lithium ion. What will happen right. is they'll launch the cars with the dual chemistry, the lithium and the sodium ion. But, um, you know, and this is the crazy thing and unfortunate thing for the United States and Europe. Sodium ion is dominated by the Chinese. Yeah, too. right. So, um, so it's it's an uphill battle, and uh, but for China for China and China for the rest of the world, if you're you're for an EV consumer and enthusiast, it's there's, there's never been a better time to be excited about all the new products and uh, and and things going on in the space. Yeah, well, one of the reasons I was asking about crash is that you know even if you put a twenty seven point five percent import tariff on a car like the Seagull, it'd still be way cheaper than anything that you can buy in the U S from a, from an electric car standpoint. So, I mean, to, to me, the, the legacies both in Europe and the U S in fact, even in, in Japan too, pretty much left the door wide open for the Chinese to come in, in the lower end of the market. Right. So, so to let me, ask BYD, you, let me, let me add, let me add Gary real quick. BYD. I had a chance to sit down with a couple of their execs. Um, they're in 51 countries right now. So, wow. Wow. So, so to you were mentioning, you know, whether this would be the empire striking back, meaning the Western legacy companies. Um, right. So do you think they thought they were accomplishing that when they came to the show and discovered that that isn't the case? Or do you think that they had the, the sense of, eh, we're not going to do so well here? I think that. In, they have to look themselves in the mirror and, and kind of be confident about the things that they're doing. But I, I think that they see their products resonating a lot better in the foreign markets, but these are kind of um, 
uh, placeholders until real reinforcements come because you know you, you hear the CEOs and the executives all saying the right thing China for China moving mm-hmm. faster and uh, Volkswagen Group Bluma had said that we're going to create this tech co it's a company that mm-hmm. that's going to uh, do the technology side it's going to work with Cariot on the software side and they're going to move 30% faster to market with digital products and services and I wrote on Twitter I was like is that impressive if you actually need to move more than 50% faster? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just that, you know, to Jeff's point, it, it, it's not just rewiring. They have to rethink and, and restart and again. So um, yesterday I sat, I was invited to sit with a, a, like 10 executives from a, a few different foreign companies and they were kind of picking my brain. And I said, you know, um, you know, car companies are traditionally product focused. And technology companies are user focused, right? And then the other thing is I asked them and they they had no idea. I go, for your software development costs, are they part of your costed bomb or your costed bill of materials? Because if you're not identifying the software development costs, then you don't care about them, right? And and so because software development costs should be, you know, your highest, your 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 fastest growing expense or one of your fastest growing expenses. And if you don't know, then this is kind of the state of what's going on in the foreign legacies because they're still too slow and they're still unsure of what they want to do. So Gary, to answer your question succinctly, I think they're trying their best, but they're kind of out of their depth because of the speed and the broad uh, level of competition, not only from brands, but within products in each segment. Because like, like uh, John said, BYD has an $11,000 car now all the way up to a $50,000 car. And they sell almost every single one of them as a hybrid. And they control 70% of the hybrid market here. Nobody talks about it. You know, Toyota gets blamed for talking about hybrids. All the while, BYD is like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sell as many hybrids as you want us to. And we'll flip it over to PEVs, you know, as fast as we need to. No problem. Whatever. So, so Jeff, when you, when you get to the Shanghai show, anything that you're specifically looking for? Uh, I would say two things. Uh, one, another thing that uh, China had is kind of leading the way on is uh, relative to kind of uh, interior decoration, uh, relative to lighting effects, uh, sound effects, just the ability to create an ambiance. They're willing to take kind of, it's an extension of the same conversation. They take chances of what happens when we do this? Uh, let's add scent, let's add light. Let's uh, So to get a sense of kind of what that looks like between the Chinese brands uh, versus the traditional brands. Uh, and the second one, honestly, uh, which is maybe uh, more pure investigative, uh, we have a lot of conversations in Europe relative to sustainability. Uh, what circularity, end of life, landfill avoidance, da da da. Uh, in China, there's less of those conversations. So, because I could just ask two after the show, and he could just tell me. Um, but I'm curious whether or not uh, any of those sustainability stories, other than BEV, I mean that's that's a massive sustainability story of in and of itself. But underneath that, is there a sub story relative to materials and processes and end of life, um, or is it just buy a BEV, save the planet? So the 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 largest largest battery maker in the world, CATL. I went to their press conference and they said that by twenty thirty five, they would be like uh, carbon neutral, or and by twenty fifty, all of their manufacturing or something like that would be kind of carbon neutral. So I think CATL recognizes that they're going international. They recognize that they're the largest battery cell manufacturer in the world. So it's important to now have this corporate citizenship angle that they're playing so that when the controversy uh, kicks up in Europe, the controversy kicks up in the, in the United States, at least that's not one of the things that people can point at. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Jeff, you probably saw this week, the European union enacted uh, legislation to impose carbon taxes on yep. imports of all different kinds, not just automotive for countries that maybe don't have very strict uh, emission or your environmental regulations mm-hmm. and Europe's going to put a tax on them to create more of an even playing field. Correct. Uh, and, and then what's the market response to that? How, how do we respond to that? Uh, 
and maybe it's a smaller subset. I mean, she's talking about the full back CATL, multi-billion dollar car. Um, in our world of, okay, plastics, there's plastics on the inside of the car. Um, we did a project over the last couple of years. I think there was actually a press release yesterday that came out on it. This came uh, out. You, US AMP uh, did a project, so that's Stellantis Ford GM. Uh, they got together with Padnos, who's a material recycler, uh, and Eastman, chemical company, uh, and YF is kind of the tier one in the midst of all that, looking at uh, landfill avoidance. Can you take automotive shredder residue uh, if you want 30 seconds on that, uh, when, yeah. when you get done with your car, you drive it to a junkyard, uh, it doesn't get driven into a lake. Uh, they take that, strip off all the valuable stuff. Then they grind it up. Anything ferrous, metallic, they can separate. And then there's what's left, uh, a giant thing of fluff uh, that all gets bound together, banded up, and either sent to a landfill or gets burned, um, both of which are not great solutions. So that, that bit at the end, that bundle is called ASR, Automotive Shredder Residue. Um, and so as a project, we worked with them and it started with US AMP um, as the provocateur to, to get the start, uh, to take that ASR and be able to reprocess it back into a material that we could mold and put back in the vehicle. Um, it's slightly more expensive than virgin material. And so you, you get to these conversations of, well, this is something that was going to go into a landfill and now it's not, it's going to go into your next car. What's that worth? The technology is, is there. It, it is ready. It's for sale. If there's any customers listening to this presentation, 1-800-CALL, <laughs> just out. Um, we'd love to put it in your next car. Um, when is the appetite there for those kind of storylines? And again, too, don't get mad. Uh, Eastman did a little bit of research when they looked at uh, people's response to sustainability, when they talked to people and said, hey, you know, how important is it for the materials inside your car to be sustainable? Eh, it was a pretty lukewarm response in the US. Eh, I guess it'd be nice, but whatever. Um, when you show them the stats on how much material goes into landfills every year from vehicles that are at the end of their life, and then say, hey, if we could like divert that and have that go back in a new vehicle, would you be okay with that? Then 100%. Everybody's like, oh my God, I had no idea that we were putting just hundreds of millions of pounds of this end of life vehicle stuff into landfills. If there's a way to divert that and get it back into a new vehicle, I'm all about that. Well, actually, your stat was 10, 10 billion pounds, Jeff, just so so it's 10, 10 billion pounds of automotive shredded material hey, go to landfills. Don't discount it, Jeff. Don't discount it. <laughs> I'm hedging my bets just in case somebody fact checks me. That's that's your that's the that's the number that the study came up with. So, uh, and that's a global number to be clear. So, right, the 100 yeah. million vehicles that get sold every year, generically, you've got 100 million vehicles kind of leaving the pipeline on the other end. Um, that's the uh, ASR. Gary's, the Gary's googling everything you say. Gary's googling <laughs> everything. You say. This is not my first smackdown with Gary. Right? Yeah. All okay, right, I so, want to so change my question, Jeff. That, that okay. So, it's this study you guys did, and you 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 proved that you could make parts. Correct. using this ASR. Mm -hmm. Okay, but here's the thing that I, I would like you to give just a little bit of clarity on is, is that the discovery was that there's 39 different plastics that are in this stuff. Correct. Okay, so how how were you able to make anything that looks halfway decent out of this, this dog's breakfast of plastics? Uh, so there's two answers to that. Uh, number one, at the moment, we're not making something beautiful. We're only making something that gets covered by something beautiful. Um, so half the plastic that we mold has a skin or it's just a carrier for something. Uh, and so we wouldn't have this be something the consumer sees or touches. Um, number two, uh, not to get too wonky on you, um, but Gary, you love getting wonky. So I'm going to get wonky with you anyway. Um, the whole notion of chemical recycling and the multiple processes for how to do that. There's a lot of chemical companies out there that are doing that. Um, the ability to do that, to convert whatever, just give me uh, some oil, some monomers, some polymers, so I, whatever. If I can break it down and rebuild it up again, I, I'll be okay. It doesn't matter what the it was. It just is a matter of series of steps to, to build it back up again. Historically though, when we've looked at those materials, it was always a multiple X cost multiplier. Oh, that, that uh, if uh, one is your normal price, it was uh, six. Ugh, boy, automotive is a little more price sensitive than that. This material is actually, boy, you're, you're a slight percentage up, uh, but it's not a multiplier up. So it's really taking technology that's been worked on for the last decades and finding a way to commercially do that. Uh, and actually Eastman was the perfect partner for that because they've been doing this uh, for post-consumers, so PET bottles, uh, reprocessing that and getting that back into uh, a new molding. You can buy water bottles that have 100% uh, recycled content uh, in their clarified Nalgene looking bottles. Uh, so taking that, all of that 
technical knowledge and applying it to ASR, breaking it down, building it back up again, and using that as a filler. We're not 100% ASR uh, into a new material that we mold. Does that make sense? Hey, Gary, uh, let, me, let me also recommend uh, the Polestar launched the Polestar 4 mm -hmm. in Shanghai Auto. Uh, Polestar's booth is stunning. It's two vehicles on stage, the Polestar 3 and the Polestar 4. Um, and Polestar has uh, used recycled materials for the interior of the majority of that vehicle. It's a, I think it looks really good. There's no back window, by the way, on that thing. It's about 60,000 euros. Um, unfortunately, Polestar hasn't done very well in China, in the, but it's done market. pretty well in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so if you want to know what some of the recycled materials are being used for in interiors, Polestar is using a lot of recycled materials mm -hmm. uh, for the interior of that vehicle. So yeah, that, that's part um, of their brand, so yeah. right? I mean, Scandinavian, sure. good for mm -hmm. the environment and their Correct. premium so they can pay the extra money for it. Yep. Yeah, although I think, too, uh, you bring up an interesting, uh, interesting to me, point of historically, uh, and we'll not name any OEMs. I think they're all guilty of it in one form or another. Uh, they create a marketing story where they say, hey, we got some uh, fishing nets that were in the ocean, and we chopped them up, and we reprocessed them, and we molded this little emblem, and there's a big kind of to-do about that. And then after a couple of years when nobody's watching, they just stop doing it. Um, and so it, it's more kind of just these little... Uh, proof point. Hey, look how good we are. It, it's it's uh, virtue casting, if you will. Whereas now we're seeing that, and this is my question of going. We're seeing the switch of is what Polestar is doing uh, icing on the cake, or is it the cake? Uh, Daimler on the EQS. I didn't name. Uh, they have a ton of stuff in the EQS. We we do the interior for that. Uh, they've got all kinds of environmental stories across the different materials, and it's awesome. Is that a one off, or is that going to become part of the DNA? of Polestar and Daimler and we just keep naming the companies. Historically, it hasn't been, it's just been kind of niceties. Um, and what the earth needs, and I think what I see coming, uh, so maybe this is my poem, uh, the day is coming where we're done with the, uh, yeah, okay, you, you, you did something that you could make, you know, hundred pounds a year of. If you can't do it at scale, don't do it. So we can talk about mushroom skins and, and we can talk about cactus skins and and maybe those do reach scale. I don't mean to pick on them that they can't, but it's only interesting once it becomes something that actually changes how we execute interiors and how we spend our money on the materials that we put in our interior. Is, is, is that like a, a, a geographically based consideration though? I mean, you know, if, if you know, the, the Europeans seem to be very sensitive to the environment Correct. Here, where and, and two, you're you're indicating that in China, that's not such a big deal. Uh, yeah, I think uh, more companies are, you know, that are going international are trying to be more responsible, right? Because uh, it, it becomes a marketing tool, like like Jeff said. So, you know, I would say it's more a socioeconomic level than it is just geographic. I think you're going to find the same kind of mindset in Europe, Japan, China, the U.S. That's saying, hey, and it's it's going to tend to be in uh, the more luxurious part of the market because, again, the, it, the co cost can be absorbed there. But I, I, I think uh, those people at that socioeconomic level are much more open to that idea. Right, and they'll expect it. And I'd also argue that we hide it a little bit better because if you go to some of these other countries that, you know, Southeast Asia where, you know, they just throw things on the street sometimes, it's it's... It's really messy. So it, we, I think it's out of sight, out of mind for Americans. But if, you know, if it wasn't as clean and, and as, as manicured, maybe we'd care about it more as well. So, yeah. Hey, I, I want to change topics here uh, as I hinted at at the, the end of the first half of the show. This move by Toyota, you know, uh, Akio Toyota has been promoted to chairman of the company. Sato-san has come in as the, the new CEO. There he is right there. And, you know, he announced that, okay, we're, we're still sticking with hybrids and our, our former strategy, but he also announced they're starting this entirely new business unit inside Toyota that is going to develop EVs. And it's not just engineering, it's engineering, it's design, it's manufacturing, it's procurement. They're throwing a thousand people at this. They claim <laughs> they're going to develop cars in half, half the time that they've been doing. They're going to assemble them in half the time that they've been doing. 
And what I find so interesting about this, and I love to get your guys' input on it, is heretofore, the only ones who have carved out EVs within the company as a business unit are Ford. You know, they, mm -hmm. they did Ford uh, Model Oval. E. And Renault, Luca DeMeo, the CEO there, has done the same thing. They call it AMP here. My opinion is that's the right way to do it, that you're not going to move your legacy operations to be nimble and agile. You got to go clean sheet with a startup mentality and, and treat this as a literally an offsite startup. But I'm just wondering, do let's start with you. What do you think? Does Do you think Toyota can pull this off? I think they can. I think, um, you know, they're the largest vehicle manufacturer in the world, 10 and a half million units in 2022. So um, whenever they make a major decision, it affects the auto industry, right? And yeah, it, it was, they were notoriously behind uh, because of Akio Toyota's uncomfortability with embracing electric vehicles. But to me, I would say that this is being forced because of what's going on in the China market. Um, and we know, and, and I agree with you, I don't know if we can have one company with half the team doing X and half the team doing Y. It needs to be focused. But, you know, um, they should not have car guys leading those those teams, though. Because, I mean, how is that going to work? Because at least with Ford, Doug Field came from Tesla and Apple. Right. Okay, all, all, so the, all the top has... people at Ford uh, Model E are from Silicon Valley, with one right. exception. None of them have automotive experience. Yeah, so that's what I mean. And, and you know, I mentioned this to you before, John. Like, that's when we know the automotive companies are really taking it seriously because I've never seen a bunch of car guys transform any company into a technology company, right? Any, any automotive company. So I don't see that. And I'm not saying Mary needs to leave or Jim needs to leave. But you know what? Some of those lieutenants that have been around for 30, 40 years, they just need to, to, to go away. And you probably don't need to refill those roles, right? Because what I would do, and I've kind of mentioned this to you before, I'd ask some of these engineering vice presidents, hey, do you know what language we're coding in for our firmware? Do you know what language we're coding in for our operating system? If they don't, they need to go. That's it. Because they need to live in this stuff, right? And so they can't oversee it. Software development is completely different. And so anyways, um, with Toyota, it's going to be cultural, but China is forcing them to move faster in this because, again, nobody thought we'd be at six and a half million cars. When bef the last time Jeff was in China, nobody thought we'd be at six and a half million, nine million almost for the world last year. And in, in a down year, China is still forecasting eight and a half to nine million NEVs wow. sold in 2023. Wow. Wow. So that's a down year. So Yeah. Jeff, your thoughts on, on transforming this whole EV effort? Yeah, and maybe just a quick response to that. Uh, I have deep, deep respect for the engineering capability. I think Toyota has better engineering than any other customer I've worked with. They, they're all deeply knowledgeable. Uh, and in this case, I think it hurts them. Uh, I, I think they, I've, I've had conversations where they take me through the physics to explain why the BEV is not the best answer relative to mineral utilization. And There's a much better way. And so in the beta VHS analogy, all right, I guess I have to make a couple of VHS, but I know beta is better. So I'm just going to wait and bide my time until somebody realizes that beta is better. And so even with uh, Toyota making the announcements, I don't know that that message has sunk into the souls of the people who work at Toyota. They still know, all right, I, our, our chairman's saying we got to do this and I, I our chairman's smart and we're going to go do that, but we're doing it kind of as an exception or because the market's requiring us to do it. They're not doing it because they are all freaking in on BEVs. It's they're begrudgingly saying, yeah, we, our leader told us we had to do this. So we're doing it. And it's tough to make systemic, dramatic uh, change that you outlined when you're kind of half in. Yeah. So yeah, that's my, yeah. that's my fear. No, no, that's a great, great input. So my theory, this is me reading the tea leaves. I could be totally wrong on this. The board at Toyota said, holy crap. Right. We had no idea that EVs would catch on this fast. We had no idea battery right. costs would come down this fast. We got to move we gotta do something. out of the way. We got to right. promote this guy to chairman. We got to bring in young blood. And so th there's no surprise at all that Sato has taken over. No, mm -hmm. everybody knew Sato was the guy, but nobody knew it was going to happen. I mean, it just came out of the blue. Boom. You know, Akio has been promoted. Mm -hmm. uh, Sato comes in and first day on the job, he right. says, boom, all new EVs. All new EV business unit within the company. 
So, all right, but, but 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 John, I know you're all excited about this and Toyota doing this, and, <laughs> and so I, I I want to quote to you what Hiroki Nakajima, executive vice president, said after Sato spoke, and and this gets lost in the weeds. He said, "Let's start with electrification. I want to begin by saying that we remain firmly committed to our multi pathway approach." Right. Yeah. And and later we're on, not all in. The, so we got to ask this, him what they're coding in. Later on, the CFO of the company said, <laughs> yeah. um, in summary, for growth in emergency, emerging markets, profitable hybrids will be used as a source of, source of income. And with a value chain of 10 million units, we will also take a wide range of business opportunities. So this is the CFO talking. This is the, the, the chief product guy talking. So basically, they're still going to be building hybrids. They're still going to be doing plugins. They, they and, and they'll still do ICEs. But, I mean, okay, but but he, me, he's the CFO. Let me leave here. you guys with this. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, let, let me just read one quote from Sato, who said, we're going to completely transform the landscape of our product production facilities. I mean, this is not incremental improvement kind of That's stuff. That's a clear this statement. Is, is slash and burn and, and move fast. Anyway, you were going to say too? BYD is the new Toyota. Yeah. That's that's what it is right now because they can do no wrong. Uh, their manufacturing efficiency is off the charts. Them and to uh, Tesla, the, the only two in 2022 in China that were able to get to, you know, millions of units, right? And this year, uh, t uh, BYD will likely outsell Volkswagen as the largest right. Auto, not BEV manufacturer, auto manufacturer in China. They'll probably get to three and a half, maybe four million units. So it is, BYD is what Tesla wants to be, to be quite frank. And so um, you guys, the people that aren't paying attention are sleeping on BYD. You got to wake up because they're setting the pace for everybody else. Be what you know. What Tesla's doing are price cuts. They're not. That's not strategic. That's 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 just defensive plays. But anyways, I digress. Yeah. So. And anyways, look. I know it's four o'clock in the morning in Beijing right now. <laughs> and so, so out, of, out of courtesy to you two, I think we should wrap the show up right now because it, I it's I'm so impressed that you stayed up for us. <laughs> And, and Jeff, you'll, you'll be in his position by Correct, Sunday, shortly. Saturday, right? Yeah, so, shortly. But it's, it's so great to have the both of you guys on. You're so knowledgeable. you got such great insights. Really appreciate having you on. Always a fun conversation, John, guys. Gary, thanks for having me. And Jeff, uh, let's, let's meet up in Detroit, man. All, all of us. Let's all meet up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. Awesome. Okay. All right. Good thanks, morning, everybody. guys. <laughs> Some safe travels. <laughs> Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. If you like this program and would like to learn more about the automotive industry, check out our website at autoline.tv or look for us on YouTube on the Autoline channel.